So solving rational expressions. So rational expressions is what we did last time we gathered. Um, it's really a setup of fractions that include sometimes a monomial, sometimes a polynomial. Right? Those are giant words to say there's basically algebraic expressions in the numerator and the denominator. So when we solve them, what we've done and we'll continue to do is find the common denominator. And then after we find the common denominator, we're going to clear the common denominator out. And then we'll be left with an equation similar to what we've seen in the past that we'll solve in a variety of ways. Um, so here is a called a example problem just to get us kicked off with. Um, C is the cost. Uh, so this is the modeling cost of millions of dollars to remove a percent of a river's pollutants. Uh, so basically what this is then is based on whatever percent you want to remove, that would go in there for P, and then that would determine then what the overall cost projection would be for cleaning up some type of environmental factor. So in this case, if the government commits to $445 million for this project, how much can be cleaned? Start by taking, obviously, the formula and realizing that, well, C is the cost. And the government is committing to $445 million. Up here, pay attention every time there's a problem, especially word problems, where it talks about the cost. Here it says the cost in millions. All right. This should be just parenthesis capital C, but when you type in capital C, apparently sometimes it changes that into the copyright symbol. It doesn't, not supposed to be the copyright symbol. But anyways, so what I do is I then replace that with 445 equals 250 P divided by 100 minus P. To solve, we need to get rid of fractions. So you look to see, well, what is my common denominator? On the right-hand side, this is my denominator. On the left-hand side, there is not a denominator. I mean, there's none written. We could write it as 1. So what does that mean? That means my common denominator is 100 minus P. And what we're going to do then is get in this habit. Then after we find the common denominator, we are going to multiply everything by that common denominator. On the left-hand side... I'll have 445 times 100 minus P. And then equals, because it's kind of like doing the distributive property. I took this, and I'm going to multiply it by everything over here. And I'm going to multiply it by everything on this side. So on this side, I'll have 250P times 100 minus P. And the denominator was 100 minus P. So again, just rewrote this together into one statement. And if I've done it correctly, there should be some things that can reduce. On the right-hand side, I see that I have that 100 minus P. And the 100 minus P, it's identical, left and right side. This reduces to 1. And that's the goal in doing what we're doing, is I want to try to get rid of the fraction. Most people don't like fractions for a variety of reasons. I think, I think fractions are just misunderstood. But once you understand how they work, you, you can work through them quickly. But for the value of getting to a solution here, we need to get rid of the fractions altogether. And we did that by multiplying. On the left-hand side, I still have 445 times 100 minus P equals the 250P. Now we go to our solving processes. Solving processes, first I got to get all my P's to one side. Well, before I can do that, the P on the left-hand side over there, that's trapped in the print, it's trapped inside the parentheses. So in order to get it out, I need to do whatever operation is happening. So this will be 4, 4, 5, 100, because it's 445 times 100, minus 445P equals 250P. And for those of you that are, you know, fast at working, you're already working ahead of me on this one because you recognize, oh, next thing we have to do is add 445P to both sides of the equation. 
On the left is 44,500. On the right is 695P, if I've added correctly. And then the last step to solve for P is divide by 645, or 695, I should say. So always a good habit, no matter what I do on a calculator, you should be doing the same thing just to make sure that you're getting the same answers. Sixty-four point oh three. But this problem up here said that P is a percent. So this is a percent. So if the government commits to putting in and investing $445 million, they are anticipating that they will be able to uh, remove approximately 64% of the river's pollutants. How'd you get the down there? We're gonna keep moving on with more examples. So we started out with kind of a bigger one, kind of give you an example of a, a word type problem you could see, but then we'll just do a few more here so we get in the habit and in what we're doing. So here we're looking at this and where I wanna start is say, well, what's my common denominator? Well, obviously I have a denominator of six, I have a denominator of four and a denominator of four. So trying to think of what number do six, four, and four all go into. You could do a lot of things. You could do 24, but the smallest number is 12. The smallest number that both four and six go into is 12. So I'm going to multiply everything by 12. Remember, 12 as a fraction is 12 over 1. So I'm thinking it's 12 over 1 times x over 4 equals... 12 over 1 times 1 over 4 plus 12 over 1 times x over 6. 12x over 4 equals 12 over 4. That's a 4. Plus 12x over 6. Just did all of my multiplying in each of those cases. Now I'm showing a lot of steps here. Then I look to see, can I reduce? Hopefully I can, because that was my goal of doing this, is I can get rid of my denominators. Four goes into 12 three times. Three X equals three plus two X. Again, all I was doing there is reducing. 12 over six is two, 12 over four is three. And reducing, dividing, because I'm multiplying only. Uh, and then lastly, then now I'm back to an algebraic equation. Solving for x, move all my x's to one side. Subtract 2x from both sides, I have x equals 3. Not a bad idea, though, with some of these to just go back in and double check. If I go back to my original equation and put my answer in, instead of the x over 4, it's 3 over 4 equals 1 over 4 plus 3 over 6. On that right-hand side, 1 over 4 plus 3 over 6 is well, plus a half. And for all my baking friends in the room, you know that a half plus a quarter is 3 quarters. For everybody else, you can just switch this into quarters. 1 half is the same as 2 fourths. Together, that's 3 fourths. It worked. It's always nice when you find an answer and it works back in an equation. We're going to keep amping it up a little bit, adding another level. <clears throat> Looking at my denominators there. I have one denominator that's 2x, another one that's a 5, another one that's an x. So I know my common denominator will have an x in it. It'll also have to be divisible by 2 and divisible by 5 which is 10, because 10 is the smallest number divisible both by two and by five. So I'm going to multiply everything by 10 over one. So when I do that over on the left-hand side, I'll have 10x over x, because again, just took 10x times one. Here I'll have 10x 
over 5 plus 30x over 2x. All right, so I'm multiplying numerator times numerator, denominator times denominator. The advantage of that 1 under there is though all the denominators stay the same. And then I go to reduce. In this fraction here, the x is reduce because x over x is 1, leaving me with 10. Here, 10 and the 5 reduce to 2. The x is still there because it does not reduce. Plus 30 over 2 is 15. x divided by x is 1. So the x is reduced to 1. And then the 30 over 2 reduces to 15. I am back to an algebraic equation. Now I work through how do I get x's all by themselves. They are. So then I need to subtract 15 from both sides. Negative 5 equals 2x. Divide by 2 because that's the opposite of the 2x. x equals negative 5 halves. So again, procedurally, we're always doing the same thing. First step, look and see what's my common denominator, or if I already have a common denominator, working to solve it just straight through that way. If not, finding it, multiplying everything by that common denominator, and if I've done it the right way, all of my denominators will reduce. They'll reduce away to nothing, so I'll just, just have an algebraic equation or expression, and I won't have to worry about uh, fractions anymore. Working with this, first thing you see is one of them doesn't have a denominator, so just, you know, I usually do that over 1 as a reminder that there is a fraction. It's just over 1. My common denominator will be 2x, so everything then gets multiplied by 2x. 2x times x is 2x squared. 2x times this will be plus 2x over x, because again, it's 2x over 1. And then this equals 2x times 5 over 2, which is 10x over 2. Look to do some reducing. The x is here reduce. I am left with 2x squared plus 2 equals 5 x. Well now I no longer have a linear equation. I have that squared in there which means it's a quadratic and now we go back to all of our work in chapter six on quadratics or five. I lose track of where we first started with this. But solving quadratics the process is you set your quadratic equal to zero. To do that we need to subtract five x from both sides. On the left, I will have 2x squared minus 5x plus 2 equals 0. If I could, I would love to be able to factor it like this right away. Unfortunately, that first coefficient, that 2, out in front of the x squared makes it harder. So then the easiest process is to use factor by grouping. So I'm going to take a times c. It's my factoring type. How to factor by grouping method. a times c would be 2 times 2, which is 4. And then I'm trying to think of two numbers that multiply to positive 4. So 2 and 2. 1 and 4. They have to multiply to positive 2, but they have to add to negative numbers. Well, if they have to add to negative numbers, then it's either going to be negative 2 and negative 2, or negative 1 and negative 4. 
Those of you that have been following along recognize that this is my pair. Why? Because those are the two numbers that add to negative 5. And then that will determine my groups. 2x squared. I'm going to now split that negative 5x into these two items. That's why we did them. I shouldn't have drawn that line. I can go like this with the line. There. So then that will be negative x, because that's negative 1. And then minus 4x, that was the negative 4. And then plus 2. I look at my two groups. My two groups are here and here. So that first group, both are divisible by an x, leaving me with 2x minus 1. Second group, both are divisible by negative 2. Why negative 2? I'm always, if this is an ever a negative in my grouping, I want to divide out that negative. So I'm going to divide out the negative because I want what's inside the parentheses to be positive. When I divide negative 4 by this negative 2 when I'm factoring it out, I'm left with 2, positive 2, positive 2x. When I divide this 2 by this negative 2, positive divided by a negative is going to be negative and that'll be one. And again, if I've done this the right way, those two, the, the, the parentheses sets that you've done when you've done this factor by grouping will be the same value. Since they are both divisible by two X minus one, that comes out in front, leaving me with just the X and then minus two. Now I'm gonna bring that over here, two X minus one times x minus 2 equals 0. That's what we had over here at the beginning, equals 0. We just forgot to bring it down each time. Equals 0, equals 0, equals 0, equals 0 up here. Equals 0. I have two things that must multiply to 0. And you're thinking in your head, what two numbers multiply to 0? Well, one of them absolutely positively must be zero. So I'm gonna split these up. I'm gonna take, well, what, if I have two X minus one, what makes that zero? Well, I'm gonna solve it. Add one to both sides, two X equals one. Two X equals one, so divide by two, X equals one half. If X is one half, that would make 1 half times 2, 1 half times 2 is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. That makes 0, and 0 times anything is always 0. What makes this one 0? It's easier to see this one intuitively. You look at it and say, well, what number do I put in here? I put in 2, because 2 minus 2 is 0. Similar to when we looked at denominators and said, what are my impossible numbers? It's that same idea, but here, it's, what are my, this is what makes it 0. Now, if you didn't see that right away, you can very simply and easily say x minus 2 equals 0, then solve that for x. But in a case like this question up here that we started with, it's now hidden off the screen. There are two different answers that would make this true. When x is a half, a half plus 1 over 1 half is five halves. When x is two, two plus one half is two and a half. Both are solutions to this equation. So as you look at a question like this gets into the idea of simplifying rational expressions, solving rational expressions. It includes figuring out how to do a quadratic that uses factor by grouping and then finding the two solutions. So one question like this actually can cover the concepts of about five or six sections of a book. It makes for good test-like questions. This is four over one. So you're looking at that and you're writing it down and then you're thinking to yourself, self, what is my common denominator? 
as we're working through this, my common denominator will be x plus 1. Technically times 1, because that's the denominator of the other one, but we don't have to write it. So then that becomes the one thing I'm going to multiply all three of these fractions by. First fraction, I'll have 8x times x plus 1 over x plus 1, because that was the denominator of the original one, equals 4 times x plus 1 over 1, which I'm not, I'm not going to write. It gets confusing if I had to start doing too much of that. Uh, not plus, sorry. Minus, keeping track of my variables there, 8 times x plus 1 over x plus 1. When I've done this, I multiply everything by the common denominator so that I can get rid of the fractions. If I have something identical in the numerator and the denominator, completely and wholly, like this entire x plus 1, this entire x plus 1, they can reduce. Didn't mean to make it blue. I'll go back to red. Leaving me with 8x on the left-hand side. 4 times x plus 1. Minus, the x plus 1's are identical, minus 8. And this is a time when you would really want to look back at your original question to see, you know, to check it. Because here's what happens. What if I take, let me change the color of my pointer. What if I take this x equals negative 1 and I put it into my original equation? I would have 8 over negative 1 plus 1. What is negative 1 plus 1? Negative 1 plus 1 is 0. And what happens when I have 8 divided by 0? I have an impossible action. So while I haven't been saying it when we've been doing these problems, you need to pay attention to your denominator and know from the original equation, are there certain things that I cannot have? In this case, I cannot have negative 1 because that would make my denominator zero, that's an impossible number. Now I solve this and I find out that my only answer that works is x equals negative one, which means although there is a solution that I can algebraically solve for, this problem itself has no solutions. It's a bit of a... So we just need that we put no solution. Yeah, you would put that all... The, if you try negative 1 back in here, you'd find out that it makes 8 over 0. So while in algebra I solved and found that my answer is x equals negative 1, this answer is actually not a solution. And since this is the only answer, that means the entire uh, 
rational expression has no solutions. You can solve, we solved and found that if there was going to be a solution, it's negative one. Unfortunately, it can't be negative one because I have, that would, that would create a zero in the denominator. Yeah. So the common denominator is x minus three. <clears throat> so when you do that, what do we get on that left-hand side? x times x minus 3 over x minus 3. Which is then equal to 3 times x minus 3. 3 times x minus 3 over x minus 3 plus 9 times x minus 3. There we so go. Cancel all. Then we start reducing. Yes, so cancel. Those reduce. Yes. These reduce. Again, if I've done my work correctly, I'll have a lot of things that reduce. On the left, I have x equals... On the right, I'll have 3 plus. Now here, if you want, you can go ahead and start swinging that stuff in. 9x minus 27. Did distributive property. And then from here, we are back to a simple, I shouldn't say simple, we are simply back to uh, an algebra, linear equation, solving for x. <clears throat> 3 minus 27 is negative 24. Divide by negative 8. And is that a good solution for us? No, it is not. We look at the original equation, we find out why is that not a good solution? Because then I'd have zero in the denominator. I'd have three minus three in the denominator. So again, while this is the answer, if I were to solve this equation, this answer is impossible in the original scenario because I'd have zero in the denominator. So my solution of three would be the only solution. However, it cannot be the solution. Therefore, this has no answer. There is no solution to this. And then we get a little bit, uh, we'll come back to this one if I have time and have the voice for it. And then I said I'd come back to this one. We've got a little bit of time. To find a common denominator in this case, we'd have to look and see if, since I have a quadratic, I need to rewrite this quadratic in a factored form. And if you've been listening to me at all this semester, you'll know that this is one of those special ones that you should just look at and go, oh, it's x plus 2 and x minus 2. It's a difference of squares. This one over here is the same thing, x plus 2 times x minus 2. And obviously this one here is just x minus 2. So then, what will I multiply by? I need to find the common denominator. This denominator has an x plus 2 and an x minus 2. This one just has an x minus 2. This one has an x plus 2 and an x minus 2. The common denominator is this, x plus 2, x minus 2. Or to take a page out of what we did at one of the, one of the previous sections, I, the other method I could do is I could just multiply only this one by 1. When I do that, my denominator becomes x plus 2 times x minus 2. And then my numerator... Because my denominators are all the same at that point, I could then just rewrite my numerator as my equation. 7x plus 5 times x plus 2 equals 2x. 
And what we've been doing today when we've cleared out the denominators is this exact same thing. There's just two different ways of tackling the same problem. Either are appropriate, either are good ways to do it. So if one of them works better for you, choose that method. Uh, then we'll just finish solving this up here using our algebra skills. I have 2x plus 10 equals 2x. Uh-oh. Subtract 2x from both sides, and I get 10 equals 0. What does that mean? When does 10 equal 0? Never, so there are no solutions. Never mind. 7x plus 5x is 12x. All right, I thought I was working ahead of myself there. So if you can tell from my voice, I've been sick for a while. I'll blame it on that. Then I'll move the 2x over. And I'll have 10x plus 10 equals 0. Subtract the 10 from both sides, and I'll have 10x equals negative 10, divide by 10, x equals negative 1. Let's go look at my original equation. What are my impossible numbers in the denominator? My impossible numbers are 2, because 2 minus 2 is 0, negative 2, and this is negative 1. So I'm good to go. This will actually be then a solution to the problem. The last topic then for this year, and by uh, yeah yeah this semester however you want to call it, um, are direct and inverse relationships. Uh, these tend to always end up being word type problems. So the two examples I have are word problems, but a direct relationship means essentially in words, uh, a direct relationship is if one variable goes up, the other variable goes up. Uh, an inverse relationship in words is if one variable goes up, it makes the other variable go down or decreases. So a direct relationship has a, a standard generic form, something like y equals uh, k times x. k is some constant, we call it a constant of variation. It just means that like in a, a linear equation, m, slope. Slope is my constant of variation in a problem. In this case, x and y are the two variables. So if x goes up, so if x goes from 1 to 2 to 3 or something like that, it'll be multiplied by k, whatever k is. And k is a constant. We'll, we'll figure it out when we're working on a problem what that value is. Um, but if x goes up, y goes up. And that's what a direct relationship is. And there's a lot of things that exist as a direct relationship. Um, the more miles you drive, the... Uh, yeah, yeah, well, that's probably... A, that'd be an inverse relationship. The more miles you drive, the less gallons of gas you have in your car. That'd be inverse. But it means an inverse relationship. Let's go ahead and just write that one down. Um, there, as X goes up, Y would actually get smaller. So if I divide by a larger and larger and larger number, y gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So this would be called an inverse relationship. As y goes up, x actually would have to go down in order for it to equal out. And k, again, will be some constant value, and, and we call it just the constant of variation, or variation constant, or something along those lines. Um, and usually, in most of the problems we're going to look at, the ones we are specifically for today, is we won't know k, so we're going to have to find that first. After I find k, then I'll make my equation, and then I'll solve for some other values of x and y. All right, but words you got to remember. A direct relationship means as one variable goes up, the other one also goes up. Inverse relationship or inverse variation means as one variable goes up, or as one variable gets larger, the other one gets smaller. 
So then here we go. The volume of blood in a person's body varies directly as the body weight W, which makes sense. Bigger people have more blood. Smaller people have less blood, which is why if you have ever gone to donate blood, which I highly encourage everybody to do if you're eligible, um, if you don't weigh a certain amount, you can't give blood. And that's just because when they would take out the pint of blood that they remove, it would be too much, too large of a proportion of the amount of blood in your body that it would not be healthy for you to donate blood. So <clears throat> if a person, so it's a, let's go back to this. We are told varies directly. As soon as we see that it's a direct variation, we're going to write down the generic formula for direct variation. And that's y equals k times x. But we don't have x and y in this case. I have two other things. I have blood and I have weight. So the volume of blood in a person's body varies directly as the body weight to the person. So I just need to choose one of those to be one and one to be the other one. It doesn't really matter. So we'll try it for b equals k times W. All right, so the, my two variables were blood volume and then body weight. B for blood volume, W for body weight. And then I'm told that a person who weighs 160 pounds, so I'm going to go down here to my equation. I'm going to have K times 160. has approximately five quarts of blood. Well, that's how much blood they have, so equals five. So they gave me one pair of points for what would work in that direct variation. I then need to find out what is my value of K. Well, it's in these cases typically gonna be just a linear equation, gotta solve for K. K times some number, so I need to divide by 110, K equals 5 divided by 110, which is 1 over 5 into 11 is 2, carry the 1, 22. So that is my constant of variation, which means I can go up here to my original equation, not that one, this one, and say B equals... 1 over 22 times W. Yes. Sorry about that, people. The problem I have with having poor handwriting is this is a 1, 6, not a 1, 1. So I divide both sides by 160. So then 5 into 160 is going to be... Uh, 32. 5 into 150 is 30, so 160 is 32. So this would be 1 over 32 for that value, not 1 over 22. So thank you for paying attention and keeping me on the correct path here. Um, then it asks in the question, estimate the number of quarts of blood a person who weighs 240 pounds. So B equals... 1 over 32 times 240, or the other way, you know, 240, which is 240 times 1, which will be 240 over 32. So they would have about 7.5 quarts. Quite a bit more than someone weighs 160 pounds. But that would be a direct variation type problem. Next problem would be, you guess it, in an inverse relationship. So here we're told that the 
rate at which heat is lost through a window pane varies inversely. The minute I see that, I'm going to write down the inverse, the generic equation for it. Um, as the thickness, so the L, which is the heat lost, and T, the thickness, those are my two variables. So I'm going to pick one of them and put them in for X and pick the other one and put them in for Y. Now, it sometimes is helpful to think which is the, now in, in math we'd say independent and de dependent, which is the cause, which is the effect. Is the heat lost a result of the thickness or does the heat lost cause the thickness? Which one causes the other one? Whichever one is the cause, that's my X. Whichever one's the result, that's my Y. So in this case, and again, you could do it and figure it out either way. It's just a little bit easier this way to think. The heat loss is my result. It is the result of the thickness of the window. Different thicknesses cause different heat losses. So if you can figure out which one's the cause, use that one for X. So now I've got my generic thing figured out, but then it gives me my one example so I can find K. It says a normal 1 8 inch thick pane. So that's my thickness. <coughs> so I will have K over 1 8 loses 400 calories per hour. Calories is a measure of you would normally think of it as how much like food is, but food would tell you how many calories you would need to burn to create enough heat to eliminate that food item. So it's so heat loss is measured in calories, and it's the same calories as your body. Because right? when you work out and you work hard, you develop heat, that heat burns calories, and then heat loss is that resultant. All right. I gotta solve for k, which means I gotta get rid of the one eighth in the denominator. How do I get rid of one eighth if I'm dividing by one eighth? Multiply by one eighth. So if I multiply by one eighth, one eighth divided by one eighth is one. Over here, multiply by one eighth. One eighth of forty is or four hundred is fifty, and that's my k. So now my equation will be. L equals K, 50, divided by T, thickness. Then it asks, how many calories per hour are lost through a quarter inch and three eighths inch window panes? Well, I gotta do two problems. So this one here, I'll do it for one quarter, so L equals 50 divided by 1 quarter, and over here, I'm going to have L equals 50 divided by 3 eighths. How many quarters are in 1? Like in $1? Well, there's 4. So how many quarters are in 50? Two hundred. Or you plug it into your calculator. <laughs> or you remember that when I divide by a fraction, that's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So that'd be the same as 50 times 4 over 1. So then here I'd have L equals 50 times 8 over 3, which is 400 over 3, which is some other number. You have to divide that and you're going to get a decimal place. But what you'll see is as the thickness goes up, over here we had an eighth, a one eighth inch pane, loses 400 calories. Quarter inch, which is larger than an eighth of an inch, 200 calories. Three eighths of an inch, even less. So the more thickness you have on a window pane, the less heat loss there will be. Going from one eighth to one quarter, I've doubled the thickness. Here I've tripled the thickness. Obviously, much heavier window panes at that point. All of our variation. 
And then those are the last two sections to be working on for checking your understanding. In preparation for the exam, the exam is a week from today. On Wednesday of this week, I will have some review questions from the first two exams to go through. If you have questions that you want covered from anything that we've done from the first two exams content, have those with you as well, which could include questions from that exam two review quiz that's online that you've taken. On Friday, I will take questions and have a few questions to give you related to content since exam two in preparation for the final exam. And then last, and probably this is the most important nugget you're gonna to wanna to hear right now, uh, for the final exam, one, you need to have your own calculator. I will not be sharing mine. So find a calculator, find a friend with a calculator, go to Walmart and buy yourself a cheap one. Um, go, I don't even know, do they loan them out at the Student Success Center? They might. Um, two, um, if you want to bring with you one sheet of paper with anything on it, you certainly can. So if there are formulas you want to write down, um, like slope, that you just never quite remembered. Quadratic formula, you never quite remembered. Um, if you wanna put example problems on there, so as reminders to yourself, especially with some of the newer content, that might not be a bad idea. Um, but it's one sheet of paper, one side only. You will turn it in with your exam, um, handwritten as you have it. And uh, when you bring it in, um, you'll sit down to take your exam with that sheet of paper and your calculator and a writing utensil or utensils plural. Um, remember, our exam is Monday at 1 p.m. It goes 1 o'clock, 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock. Um, I do not know if there's an exam in here before that. Monday at 1 o'clock, this room. A uh, single piece of paper with, again, virtually anything you want to write. Words of encouragement, fine. You can do it. Be confident in yourself. Stuff like that. Scripture references, go for it. Um, but that's what you can have then for the exam.